And good Thursday morning, everyone. Happy Friday Eve. This is a live look over downtown Denver. Ooh, it was really nice outside yesterday. Going to be nice again today before we get a little bit of snow overnight. And the mountains also expected to get some fresh powder today as well. Good morning, everyone. Jordan, Corey, Erica, and Ed with you to start your day. Yes, good morning. There's a possibility of a little snow sandwich between some really nice weather. Yeah, I think this is a forecast. It really has something for everybody. If you want some snow, we got that on the way. If you want temperatures in the 60s, I have that on the way as well. Let's take a look at what we have going on right now. 28 degrees in Denver at this hour. That's about nine degrees above normal for this time of year. So we're already starting off on the mild side. You see the temperatures around the state, teens, 20s, and 30s. So this is the way it goes. Increasing clouds continued mild today. We'll see a high of 51. We saw 52 yesterday, but then overnight we could see a little light snow. That ends early tomorrow morning with a high of 41, so we will be colder. But here comes another warm up. Seasonal on Saturday, 55 on your Sunday. Monday, Monday we're at 58 degrees. The sunshine stays with us as it does on Tuesday. And look at this high, 60 degrees. Pretty beautiful, Ed. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Right now, a live look at the drive for you. I-70 in the mountains right around Loveland Pass here. Really light volume, not a whole lot to worry about. I-70 in the metro at 270. Same story, just a couple cars out here this hour. 225 in Mississippi moving along nicely. So is 270 and Vasquez through Commerce City. Let's take you to the graphics really quickly here. Seeing just lots and lots of green. No major trouble spots to worry about at this time of the morning, just after 5 o'clock on your Thursday. Denver to Boulder Drive, just under 20 minutes on westbound Highway 36. And we're looking at 14 to 15 minutes for your travel uh, between downtown and the Denver Tech Center on I-25. Erica, thank you. A Silverthorne police officer who shot and killed a carjacking and shoplifting suspect will not face any charges. The district attorney's office said that Connor Hart shoplifted at a Silverthorne TJ Maxx on October 16th and then tried to steal a car in the parking lot before police arrived on scene. When officers arrived, Hart, who was armed, ran off and made four attempts to forcibly steal cars from other drivers, including some who were in traffic along Highway 6. The DA's office says a Silverthorne officer witnessed the attempts and yelled at Hart to stop before firing his gun several times. Hart died on the scene. The DA ruled the officer's use of force was justified because not only was his life in danger, but also innocent drivers. Health workers inside Colorado hospitals say they are dealing with increasingly violent situations without enough protection, but they are split on the best way to fix that. A bill from Democrats, Colorado legislature would create violence prevention committees at health care facilities made up of existing staff. Facilities would develop a plan, train employees, track incidents, and offer follow-up services. Supporters like the Colorado Nurses Association say it provides health care workers with a standardized process for dealing with violence, but still gives hospitals the flexibility to tailor their response on a case-by-case -case basis. The Colorado Hospital Association has not endorsed the bill just yet. They say the problem is pervasive, but question if this bill is the right approach. It won't be something that we feel like we have to hide from the public. We engage with our local police officers. We engage with our district attorneys. We engage with our frontline staff and inform policy that benefits everyone so that workers are safe and patients are safe. We are definitely for the concept, which is to find ways to protect health care workers. What, what we are evaluating is the specific provisions of the legislation to make sure that it is actually meaningful and doesn't just create new reporting requirements or duplicate um, requirements that are already on the books. This violence prevention bill would also extend to freestanding ERs and even assisted living facilities. Well, today, a House committee will talk about ways to help pet owners access a veterinarian. One bill would let veterinarians have virtual appointments without needing to see the pet in person first. The other would create a vet PA position for people with a master's in veterinary medicine to work under a vet's supervision. They could diagnose conditions, prescribe medicine, and perform certain surgeries. The Dem Friends League is part of the group advocating to get these bills on the ballot. They want to make it easier for pet owners to get expert advice. We need to create options that people can access because people want to care for their pets. And no matter, you know, if a pet has a wealthy owner or not, they feel the same amount of pain. They get sick the same amount and they deserve to get care. If the House committee approves the bill, bill sponsors will work to collect enough signatures to get the bills on the November ballot. 
Plans to consolidate the Poudre School District are moving forward again, and there are some big changes this time around. The school district presented its first plan this fall, but got a ton of pushback, especially from students. The district says change does need to happen. Enrollment is declining and facilities need major upgrades. But this time around, the planning is going to be more community led. A community of parents, community leaders and school staff members will take feedback before making any recommendations to the district. Students say they're happier with the solution. I think everyone's a lot more confident that they're going to be heard and we know that we're being heard by uh, the district and the board and this committee is just another step of them trying to help get our input. The committee will start its work next week then in March it will hold listening sessions for the community to weigh in on possible consolidation plans. Nearly 3,000 more kids will be eligible for full day preschool funding next year under a new rule passed this week. The state will guarantee 30 hours of taxpayer funded preschool per week for children living in poverty. That applies to families at or below federal poverty guidelines. That's currently about $30,000 a year for a family of four. The rule will be in effect for next school year unless it gets extended. Families might also qualify for full day funding if they make more than the federal poverty standard, but they have to have a second qualifying factor like homelessness or having a student in foster or kinship care. This Saturday is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. It is a day to honor the lives of six million Jews and millions of others murdered by the Nazi regime. Now, News reporter Courtney Yoon joins us live in Denver. Now, Courtney, it's a day of remembrance as well as a call to action. Yeah, that's right. Good morning, Corey. While many people will be remembering and mourning the people killed during the Holocaust, there will be some scholars in the Denver Metro that want to discuss what we've learned from this era and how to move forward. Now, historians have wrestled with understanding the perpetrators of the Holocaust and why they did the horrific things they did. On Monday, CU Boulder is hosting two public lectures. One of the speakers, Mark Roseman, is a distinguished professor of history and Jewish studies at Indiana University. In his lecture on Monday, he plans to discuss discuss the long held belief among historians that those responsible for the Holocaust were quote ordinary men. In other words, people caught up in a situation which led them to behave a certain way. Roseman says it has relevance to our society today in the US. The worrying thing for us should be not so much ordinary people just put in that situation will do this, but societies when subject to certain pressures and using some ingredients that are already there can be moved to a point where it's perfectly thinkable that representatives of that society will act in such and such a way. Both lectures will be held on Monday, one in the afternoon and one in the evening. You can attend uh, Roseman's lecture either in person or online. We'll put some information on our website, 9news.com, with times, dates, and locations. Corey, Jordan. That's great. Thanks for the heads up, Courtney. Well, it looks like the new gray wolves in Colorado are making themselves at home. CPW put out a new map using the GPS collar data collected from the 10 wolves recently released and two wolves in North Park that migrated down from Wyoming. The map shows where they have been in the past month, and you can see they have reached as far west as Garfield County. Wildlife workers uh, loose, lost those 10 wolves last month in Grand and Summit counties. They were following the directive that Colorado voters narrowly approved in 2020 to reintroduce wolves to the state. The state plans to release up to 15 more wolves in December of this year. Xcel Energy will spend billions to generate more power from greener sources and customers are going to pay for it. This week, regulators decided to cut a couple billion dollars out of the plan to raise rates. Xcel is trying to meet state mandated emissions cuts by 2030 and put forward a $15 billion plan to do it. The Public Utilities Commission approved part of the plan this week to build more solar and wind projects across the state, but they're holding off on permission for $3 billion worth of power line improvements in the metro area. The PUC wants an independent analyst to look at the power line projects and decide whether they're worth it.